So thank you very much for coming today. I'd like to introduce uh, John Follis, our speaker, to you. I had the pleasure of, of meeting John uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago. Uh, we had a long conversation. You, by the way, you all have a copy of his bio in, in your packages, so you know he's a big-time marketing guy from uh, Park Avenue slash Madison Avenue in New York City, a large advertising firm, has worked with you know, large multinational corporations, um, a very established author, works for, writes for places like Adweek, but more importantly, in coming back to Connecticut and starting to think more about marketing with more entrepreneurial concerns, I mean, John really hit a nerve that really resonated with me in that all of you, especially social media, you know, everyone who's here is working on things that have more to do with, with syndicating information. Just because you can make it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be valued or viewed by others as essential to their lives. And I really think that if there's one aspect of this program that we overlooked in our inaugural year last summer, it was marketing. It's all about creating stuff. We spent scant time thinking about how to actually figure out how to convince people that what we were doing was something that would be essential to their lives. So to redress that issue, we're very fortunate to have John talk more about marketing and its place in, uh, you know, in new, new venture creation. So with that, I'll, I'll give you John. Thanks, Jim. We've been bragging all week that I'm speaking at Yale. I feel very, uh, very intelligent. But whether you're using technology or not, when it comes to marketing your business or your product, it comes down to engagement. You can have the best product or service or website or technology, but if you're not engaging your customer, it doesn't really matter. So... That's part of what I'm going to be talking about today. And it's going to be a little bit difficult because without really knowing what each one of your individual businesses is, I can only talk in generalizations. Uh, I think the problem with a lot of um, startup ventures is that they don't know how to simplify their message and their benefit, not just what they are, but what the, the essence and the benefit of their company is. One way that many companies do this, especially if they're not in a category that, that people really are familiar with, is with something that's called a tagline. A tagline, it's like a, a one-sentence phrase that captures the essence of your product or service. Not every company has one. Uh, some companies like Mercedes, because they've got such a strong brand, may not necessarily have one or feel the need to use one because all you need to say is Mercedes and they've established that brand so well that they don't really need to de define it. But many other companies and services do that to help excite their prospects. And I'm going to be saying that a lot today, excite your prospects, because you can inform people and not necessarily get them to buy into what you're selling. You have to inform them and excite them. And the way to do that is not just from an intellectual standpoint, but a combination of intellectual and emotional. A lot of very intelligent people forget the emotional part, that you're still dealing with human beings who've got very busy lives, have little time to focus on what it is that you're trying to sell them. So you have to figure out what emotional nerve you've got to tap into to touch that person and get them to go, huh. So that's something you may want to think about, how to come up with a tagline. And I'm going to plug my blog, which is thefollisreport.com, which talks about a lot of this stuff. It talks about every aspect of, of marketing. You can go there and click on, I think I have in the sidebar something on taglines. You can go ahead and read that. I should give you my podcast as well. That's called The Marketing Show. And that is themarketingshow.net. The format of that is me interviewing business owners who have tried things, some of which have worked and some haven't worked, so you get the benefit of learning from their experience. And even though it may not be particularly directly related to your business, of the 17 different interviews, you may find a couple of them that might be interesting. There are a lot of people who say that advertising doesn't work anymore and it's all about PR, and, and to some extent that's true. Traditional advertising is uh, becoming less and less of a way to go because 
People just shut it off. And, and when I say marketing, a lot of people think advertising. They get very confused by the lingo, just the way I get confused by a lot of tech lingo. They hear the word marketing, they think advertising. Marketing includes everything. It includes advertising, PR, blogging, podcasting, any way that you engage your prospect is marketing. Word of mouth, writing articles, face-to-face, one-to-one, anything. That's, it's, that's the, the big umbrella. And advertising used to be a huge part of it. It still is. I mean, if you uh, look at uh, most major advertisers, I'd say more than half of the money that they're spending is on pretty traditional stuff, TV, radio, print. But that's changing. It's been changing for years. And every year, Adweek comes out with a report that discusses where major advertisers are spending their dollars. And every year for probably the past five or six years, the traditional numbers have been going down, while non-traditional, or I should say online uh, advertising dollars and marketing dollars are going up 25% annually. So although, I mean, at one point, online marketing was just 5% of the budget. Now I think it's, it just beat out radio or cable TV as where advertising is putting most of their, their dollars. And uh, it'll be interesting to see where it stops. You know, it, things are changing so quickly. It's, it's almost hard to keep up with it. Public relations, I think, is a great way to try to get the word out about what you do. And the way public relations is going to be really effective is if you come up with something that's really pressworthy. A lot of people think that they can get public relations when they don't really have anything that's that, that press worthy to say. You want it hopefully to be good press when you get press. I do not believe that all press is good press. I think there's good press and there's bad press. And the reason why that can be very effective is for that very reason that you're not presenting. It's, it's from a third party, hopefully someone who's respected. If you get in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, you're written up by you know, a very well-respected editor people are going to look at that with pretty high esteem. So that's not easy to get, but if you can get it, that's a very effective way of getting your message out to people. And as I mentioned, the way you can help generate that is come up with something that's genuinely pressworthy. We did that when we had our agency in New York. Our advertising in general was pretty edgy. I have a philosophy that it's better to upset or piss off 10% of your audience than bore all of them. So most advertising that you look at is pretty boring. So we, we tended to push the envelope a little bit and it was rare when we didn't do something that rattled some people's feathers. You know, as long as you're responsible. Did you give an yeah, I'll give you a few examples. One example, uh, we did a... Um, I mean, sometimes we did it without even realizing it. There's a, a, an off-price retailer in New York called Daffy's. I think it's New York and Philly, where you could get clothes really cheap, like 40 to 70 percent off. And our whole strategy was basically, you're, you know, you're a fool if you pay retail. So one of the ads that we did, which was in the form of an outdoor billboard, was the headline, if you're willing to pay over $100 for a dress shirt, may we suggest a jacket to go with it? And it was a straight jacket. <laughs> and uh, that was all over the streets in New York. And um, yeah, we thought it was just you know, a very funny ad. However, uh, we started getting some phone calls from the Alliance for the Mentally Ill. Now, it, perhaps this is a bad example because we didn't intentionally try to do something that was pressworthy. We just, our, our advertising in general tended to have a lot of attitude. And in this case, it generated some press because the Alliance people uh, were pretty upset and informed us that straitjackets are no laughing matter and that people have had problems and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, we, we respectfully listened to what they said, but we didn't want to change our advertising just because they had a problem with it. Well, it didn't stop there. They started calling up the press. They started calling up the, uh, the four A's, the American Association of Advertising Agencies, the governing body of ad agencies. 
and said that one of your ad agencies is doing something that's uh, very politically incorrect and offense, highly offensive, and we would encourage you to you know, tell them to stop doing it. And, of course, we were kind of loving all of this because um, it started getting in the press. In fact, it actually got in the New York Times. It was a pretty big article in the New York Times about this. Now, you have to understand these are the same people that had a problem with the Almond Joy campaign that said sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. So, yeah, you, you know, you have to t take it with a little bit of perspective, but as soon as they started calling the four A's and, um, you know, we didn't want to look like bad guys that we were ignoring this, but by the time it finally got to a point where, you know, we felt like we needed to really take their response seriously, it had been out for several months and we were about to change it anyway. So, you know, that, that was one case. Another case was a um, client called Tri-State Insurance that was like Geico. So you could save a lot of money on your car insurance. And I came up with a, an idea that said Tri-State can save you hundreds off your auto insurance. How you spend that, that's up to you. Now what that did was kind of open up this idea to any kind of wacky, crazy ways of spending money, right? One ad had a dog and a fur coat and jewelry. Another one had a very, very funny shot of a guy jumping out of a plane and like the, the terror on his face. It was all blurry and it was, just a, it was just a great photo. And another one was a blow up sex doll. <laughs> Now, the client was actually like a 42-year-old woman who you know, wore very short skirts and said, I don't care if you're very sexy with this or controversial, I don't mind. In fact, she actually encouraged it. However, you know, we did get a few calls from you know, some librarians, that nothing against librarians, that um, said, you know, I think this is disgusting and you know, who are you and all this stuff. But, Again, we got a lot of attention and our target audience, again, you have to, as long as you're understanding who your target audience is, in this case, we were talking to guys in Brooklyn who drove Camaros, you know, and, you know, drank beer. So for that audience, it was, it was a very good ad. And we're just having some fun. And if that was the only ad that we did, or the first ad that we did, then perhaps it would have been a little bit in bad taste. But in, in that case, it was just one in the series of ads, and, and it was a very successful campaign. I'll give you a, another example. I, one of my clients was a church. So, you know, what do you do for a church that's engaging but still kind of respectful of this church that's been around since um, it's a marble collegiate church in, in Manhattan? And I think it, uh, the building was erected in... 1852, and it goes back to when uh, Peter Stuyvesant came to Manhattan. So the, the lineage of the church went back to the, to the Dutch when they settled Manhattan. So, you know, there's a lot of history there, and there's a lot of, you know, there's, you have to be sensitive. And, and, of course, all the, you know, the deacons and all the, the people at the church are, you know, pretty conservative. However, the reason that the head minister came to me was because I was peripherally involved with the church and he also was smart enough to know that to grow his church he had to target the 20 year olds in Manhattan who were doing many other things than going to church on Sunday morning so I knew that I had to come up with something that had a little bit of an attitude and some of the media vehicles we were thinking of was uh, subways and some outdoor stuff and in New York outdoor works very good because there's just so many people so I just came up with a series of one-liners, basically, that had a little bit of attitude. One of, the first one was, now that spirituality is cool, here's where to get some. Another one said, make a friend in a very high place. Uh, another one said, in this town it doesn't hurt to have God on your side. That was actually before 9-11. Another one said, oh, and they had a really good buffet brunch after the service. You, they had like this top chef and the food was really good. Uh, so another one was this Sunday, feed your soul and stuff your face. Another one, they have a nice coffee hour afterwards. And I said, um, our coffee hour is happier than most happy hours. So, 
so I just tried to have some fun with it. Uh, our product really does perform miracles was another one. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to run that one. He didn't want to run that one. And the other one he didn't want, want to run was, uh, you don't have to be a sinner to attend our church, but it helps. <laughs> And, you know, I was, uh, I thought that was great because part of the problem was that I felt that, you know, we're talking to, to young people that go out Saturday night, go crazy, and they may not think they're worthy to go to church the next morning or something like that. So I wanted to kind of give the impression that, you know, don't worry about it, you know, just come on that we're cool, you know, that kind of a thing. That was basically the, the message. But when he saw that ad, he said, we can't run that ad because, and I, I didn't really understand why, and he thought that it was um, like wagging the finger, calling people sinners. There's a little bit of a difference between being up in front of a congregation at the pulpit, wagging your finger, calling them sinners, and then having an ad that says, you don't have to be a sinner to come to our church, but it helps. He didn't seem to quite get the difference. Uh, however... I encouraged him to think about it. I think he showed his, um, his kids or his grandkids or something, and they probably said, cool. And that's probably what got that ad you know, uh, approved. But after the ad ran, about a year, I asked him how it was going. He said, oh, it's great. People love the ads. He said, but the one that they like the most and talk about the most is the Sinner ad. So that was a case where, again, it was a little bit edgy, but uh, it, it seemed to work. Yeah. I want to share. I'm often asked by um, the ventures that I mentor, Again, you know, they probably have to name the logo, the website together. What are the first three things they need to do in marketing and PR? Highest impact, lowest cost. What are three things, marketing or PR, that they can do right out of the gate? Because a lot of these messages require advertising, require budgets. What are things you can do? Highest impact, lowest cost. Top three great things. name, great logo, great tagline. Your, your corporate identification, I think, is a great place to start. It really helps. That's going to be on everything you do. That's going to be on your business card. Um, I'll show you something. You know, people don't take business cards that seriously. And uh, a business card can be one of the most effective things you could do to excite your prospects because you never know who you're going to be handing it out to. My whole business model is getting people excited. I could say I'm a marketing guy or an advertising guy, but the emotional benefit is that I will help you get people excited. So I can't hand out a business card that looks like I work for Citibank. You know, that, that would be a disconnect there. And again, this is a problem I have with so many marketing people. They talk the talk, they don't do it themselves. So what good advertising or, mar or good marketing does is sometimes saying less is more you, if you just do things that intrigue people. It's all about attraction versus chasing. A lot of people I talk to are, are salespeople, and I don't think they really understand this, is that you don't want to be chasing people. You want to have people bump into you and think that they found you. Good marketing is like positioning your, yourself in front of someone and having them bump into you and think that it was them that found you when, in fact, you kind of worked things out so they bumped into you. A few years ago, I, I came up with a term called G-Cred, and G-Cred stands for Google Credibility, and it, it comes down to credibility. What is credibility? A few years ago, everyone was talking about street cred. Are people on the street talking about this product? You know, before they were blogs, they were street cred. What people are really, really talking about, believing what your friends and your peers have to say about something because you can't trust the traditional media. So I came up with this term G-Cred, which I think is an evolution of street cred, which is what people see when they go to Google. And I think that is one place where you really have to develop a presence. Uh, no matter who you are, no matter what your business, product, service is, uh, even if you're an individual, professional person. Yeah? Uh, so let me make sure I'm reading this right. So you think we should invest in search engine optimization and search engine mar marketing to make sure? Well, I would start with organic. Okay. I, I think that, you know, whatever you can do organically, you know, depending on what you're, you know, if you're selling Cuban cigars, I think a, a pay-per-click is pretty good because people are going to be king in Cuban cigars. Those are very definable keywords that people can be searching for. For someone like myself, you know, attention-getting marketing, people aren't going to really be typing that. It doesn't make sense for me to do a keyword search. However, it makes a lot of sense for me to be um, on the Internet 
uh, organically. And if you type in my name, I'm all over the place. So anything you could do organically, and this is where press helps. This is if you give a talk. I give talks and they, they post it on the internet. This is why blogs are good. So to your point, I would say blog you know, is certainly one thing that you could do to start generating some attention for your business. Uh, when you talk about getting the excitement and the emotional response, I mean, this is something you're obviously an expert at, and it seems like you're able to hit it right on, whereas most of us, you know, maybe sometimes we get it perfect. But, uh, you know, like you're saying, different people have different core things they're interested in. So making that sale, you know, whether it's that elevator pitch to the different types of people, could you give us some advice on how to become better at that or tell us how you became so good or was it a natural talent? On my blog is a lot of insight. I talk about something, um, for example, creativity versus discipline creativity. That uh, ad I did for Daffy's with the straitjacket, for example. You could say that was a very uh, creative ad, and it was, but that was based on a very simple sound strategy that basically said, you know, you're an idiot if you pay retail. So, you know, how do we come up with that idea? Well, you didn't see the 97 other ideas that we came up with and threw in the trash before we got to that one. It takes a lot of work, and, you know, I, I sat in many classrooms in, in New York being taught by some of the best creative people in the city. And it wasn't until I was in the business four or five years before I really feel like I got it. I had... Um, graduated Syracuse University with a degree in advertising design and then worked in the business several years and came to New York, I couldn't get a job. I, I don't know, four or five years experience and I could not get a job. And I was being told I need to go back to school <laughs> to, to learn advertising, which is kind of a, an ego deflating message to get after you've been in the business for several years and worked at some major agencies in a city like Chicago and even won a couple awards. So once I kind of got over the, um, the bruised ego, I, um, I started taking some, some more night classes at School of Visual Arts taught by some top advertising professionals who, would, who were adjunct professors. And they took me several courses. Just In fact, one course I took, I think, three times because I really, I just felt like I needed to hear it. It's like repetition. So it took me quite a while to get to the point where I really felt like I knew how to do a very exciting, effective piece of creative. So, you know, I'm not going to be able to stand here in, in 20 minutes and, and kind of give you the secret of doing creative advertising, but at least I can give you some things to think about if you go to my blog. So, sometimes the best way to learn about how to think creatively is follow other people's examples, you know. So, um, if you go to my main website, if you just want to look at some ads, just to see, see some creative award-winning work, if you go to Follis, F-O-L-L-I-S, Inc.com, and you can just look at some samples. Some of the ads that I've mentioned are on there, but um, I have a lot of samples if you just want to, you know, see creative thinking. Yeah. On your website while you're talking about it, I visited it this morning. It was a thing for, for a while. And the Follis, Inc. one? The, the eyes, the eyes, yeah, okay. And I noticed that it basically didn't follow any of the traditional ways of doing a website, right? Where people know they can immediately go to this page, look for Contact Us, and right there is the phone number. So my question is, how did you decide where that line is? You've got to grab someone right away. And so many websites do not do that, or they, they go the opposite way, where they've got... 20 seconds of self-indulgent flash that you cannot get out of and they think it's the best thing they've got their dancing logos and all this stuff and I don't know about you but the last thing I want to sit around looking at if I want quick information is someone's dancing logo. Uh, I noticed you had a Wikipedia article. What's your take on Wikipedia articles for companies? My profile is on Wikipedia that links to some articles that sort of a thing. But getting articles anywhere, if you guys know how to write or like to write, if you can write articles and submit them, you know, it goes back to the, the whole G-Cred thing. You want to have as much content online that shows up when people Google you. It's just the, it's the new credibility thing. So wherever you can get stuff posted on forums, anything, just write about it. And this is why places like Facebook and Twitter, and if you can create 
some kind of evangelist. You know, every successful company started very grassroots. It just started with a small group of people. You know, Microsoft just started with a small group of people who had a vision and an excitement and a passion and created other people who were excited about the same thing. And it grew very organically, you know, before they, they, you know, they started having advertising and media budget. So there's no reason why your companies can't do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you spoke earlier about um, engaging your prospects. And I was just wondering if you, if you could talk a little bit more about how much of that engagement occurs at the marketing level and how much of that engagement occurs at the product level? Uh, what do you mean uh, at the product level? Well, I mean, how much of the actual engagement has to do with, you know, the customer loving your product and how much of it does it have to do with, you know, you it, sending that message out? About yeah, product? it really helps if you've got a great product. Great marketing will help a bad product fail faster because they'll use it, they'll think it's terrible, they'll tell all their friends. If there's a new movie coming out and you see all these ads about, you know, see the, the new, the latest, you know, Sly Stallone movie, you know, Rocky 17. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, they spent, you know, $15 million or $20 million broadcasting this, billboards, TV, online, everything, right? And you see the movie, it sucks. You're going to probably, on Twitter, say, I just saw the movie, it sucked. With movies, people don't know whether it's a good product or not until after they've, they've made the film. And, you know, they, they, the public is the ultimate barometer of whether it's good or not sometimes. But it really starts with the product. The, the more innovative, the more exciting the product is, everything else will be easier. For example, um, years ago, one of our clients was a company that made all fruit jam. Now this was in 1988. I mean I never thought about jam and I, after meeting with this client he kind of educated me about jam and the fact that most jams are corn syrup and refined sugar like 60 percent corn syrup and refined sugar and eight percent fruit. Which was kind of an interesting enlightening fact for us to learn about whereas his product was hundred percent fruit and fruit juice. So I thought that's a pretty interesting story to tell. You know, for people who like care about their health, I think that's pretty um, impactful and we just have to communicate that in an exciting way. But we felt that there was a very big market for that if we could communicate it. And the way we did it was to go after Smuckers because everyone knew Smuckers Jam who kind of built their brand around the idea of, you know, America's jelly and grandma and kids and apple pie and you know puppy dogs and all this stuff and it was all bullshit you know just because it's named Smuckers doesn't mean it has to be good and that basically was our tagline our line was uh, with 100 percent fruit it has to be better so that was a case where we had a product that was inherently better than the competition so that was an extremely successful we did um, some TV and print at the time and the print was pretty simple. We had their jar with their tagline above it and our jar with our tagline above it and a 50 cent coupon off to, to sample Saul Ridge. So when you're looking at Smuckers with the tagline with a name like Smuckers it has to be good and then right next to it Saul Ridge with 100% fruit it has to be better and then a 50 cent coupon why wouldn't you want to do that? You know, So that was, that was the, the print work and then the TV nearly gave the president a heart attack when I presented a TV commercial because it started with the Smucker's tagline, who's his main competitor. Initially, when I first presented it, I said, okay, here's, here's how you, you should spend your $300,000. You start with the Smucker's tagline, and he's going, <gasps> and what he wasn't realizing is I was kind of dismantling the tagline. It was, this, it was a voiceover basically saying, for 30 years, Smuckers has been telling you they have to be good, but in fact, they're made with mostly corn syrup, refined sugar, and not a lot of fruit. And every time he, he, he made one of those points, a pair of hands from the bottom of the t TV screen would patch over, it was with a name like Smuckers, it has to be good, and over the, the words, it has to be good, he would patch over with matching type, it might be good, it could be good, is it really so good? So we were basically dismantling their tagline and paying it off with our benefit, which was 100% fruit, and it was very successful. Yeah. We hear a lot about viral marketing and how important that is for launching a new thing, especially if you're trying to build a core uh, group of users. 
uh, that has to be large. How would you, can you talk a little bit about viral marketing and dynamic? Yeah, is everyone familiar, anyone familiar with Jib Jab and the uh, presidential animation, the, the Carrie Bush animation that was created about four years ago? Yeah. yeah. Who, who has seen that? Okay. Well, you know, that's a, that's a great example of viral marketing. For those of you who don't know, there are a couple of guys who were animators and they were trying to get some attention for the company. They're based in Brooklyn. I think they're brothers. And uh, very talented guys. And they did these funny animations and they decided to choose the presidential, the, uh, at the time, the upcoming presidential campaign in, in 04 uh, with Bush and Kerry to do a parody of these candidates in this um, this land is your land, this land is my land kind of sing-song parody. And it was hilarious. They, I mean, they did a brilliant job. They probably got a ton of favors from all their, their friends doing voiceovers and doing different things. And uh, they just sent it out. And I think within two weeks it had something like six million views or something incredible like that. It just, it just went crazy virally and about a month after they put it out they were being interviewed on uh, Good Morning America and some major uh, morning news shows and I think about three months after it went out they were doing uh, projects for Budweiser and Nike and some you know major brands just based on this animation that it was funny and you know what makes something viral and not viral it's really really hard to say another example is uh, Blendtec. Is anyone familiar with Blendtec, the, bl the blender? Raise your hand if you know about the, the blender. Blendtec is a blender company that got the idea, I don't know if it was their idea or not, someone got the idea that to demonstrate the quality and power of our blender, what if we blended things that you wouldn't normally think of blending? Like, what, what were some of the things that they blended? I think they blended an iPod. Uh, they, they blended an iPhone. They blended things that you just never would think of. A baseball bat. They stuck in a rake. I think they, like, put this rake. It was, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was like a chipper, you know? And this thing is just like a... And, and I don't know if it's a consumer product or a business-to-business -business thing, but they just, anything you could think of, you know, just for, you know, attention. They put like a teddy bear in there and stuff, you know. Just, just things to, for attention value. And it was just, it was funny. It, you know, it was like, it was over the top. And like half the people in the room here have, have seen it. That, that just gives you a... Um, if you see it, you remember it. If you see it, you remember it. And here we are talking about it again. So it's now, if you haven't seen it, you'll make a little note, check out the Blendtec video, you go see it. So, I mean, what better way to demonstrate the quality of your product? You know, something like this is something that you'd want to share with your friends. Yeah. I'm sorry, I had a question. Going back to the jam, um, yeah. the jam advertising, um, a lot of our companies are a lot more complicated than just jam. Like when you say jam, everyone knows what it is right. and you use it. Right. And so I feel like even if we give a one-liner, people are still going to be confused and like have another question. So I was wondering if you had a suggestion of how we could create That's a very good question. I'm glad you, glad you asked that because you're right. You know, Not everything is going to be as simple as people know what jam, people know what smuckers is, that sort of a thing. Uh, you've got to get to the what 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 is the core emotional benefit that you that you're dealing with who are you talking to and on an emotional level what is really gonna um, get them excited about your product it's better to be a little vague but be intriguing than to try to cover everything but be boring yeah can you talk a little bit about how you go about measuring the results of your marketing campaigns um, in traditional media? Yeah, that's a very big question and it, uh, it's the source of a lot of frustration to a lot of people because it's not always easy to do. The P&Gs, the Procter & Gamble's of the world have hundreds of people that kind of deal with just that and they have their own metrics that they've devised, that they've determined are good ways of measuring that. They have, you know, a lot of times they'll do um, recall tests where they'll invite people in and they'll interview them and they'll ask them a series of questions. Have you, you know, focus groups, things like that. Have you seen this? You know, that's one way that can do it. If you're running a sale ad in a newspaper, you can pretty much gauge how effective it is if you're running an ad on Friday and you're having a sale and, and you know, how many people come in the door the next day. But there was a, a famous line said by someone a hundred years ago 
which is uh, I know that half the money I spent on advertising is wasted. I just don't know which half. And I don't know that it's changed a whole lot since then, quite honestly. You know, even with all the metrics and the online and the, the you know, Google Analytics and all this stuff, it's still debatable. The main focus of many social media conversations right now is, is measuring this stuff. If we're trying to tell advertisers to, or if advertisers are realizing they've got to shift more and more traditional dollars to online media and do things like social media blogs and podcasts and all these, these things, how do you measure effectiveness? I'm still trying to understand Google Analytics. I have a client right now who was saying, I've got traffic coming to my website, but they're not converting, they're not buying. What, how do I figure out why that is the case? I don't know the answer to that. This is a question I've been asking, and I've been told by people, I was at a couple of seminars, they, they say that if you really know how to read these analytics, that's, that's one way to do it. Look at these, the logs of how people, w what the exit page is on the website, things like that. Um, is there any correlation between brand advertising and uh the extent to which you would want to use brand advertising and the, and the potential for the for the company's ability to provide a societal benefit, where there is there is this sort of like warm fuzzy feeling. Yeah. That they're successful. The world's going to be a better place. Like yeah. Well, cause marketing has been around for a while. One of the companies that or people that did that years ago was Kenneth Cole. A lot of designers, you know, have to figure out how to d differentiate themselves and maybe. Kenneth Cole just wanted to be different from a marketing standpoint, but I think he also truly believed in some of the causes that he stood for. But his early advertising back in the 80s tied in with social causes that he was personally concerned about. For example, AIDS prevention. We did an ad for him, and this again, he kind of initiated the idea, I want to, I want to do an ad on this for AIDS research. And his first few ads didn't even show shoes. And a lot of it was um, tying into current events and it was very funny and it was very topical. But he did start doing a lot of cause-related things. This particular ad showed a condom and the headline was, our shoes aren't the only thing we encourage you to wear. People always want a good product or service, but they also sometimes want to think that they're buying something bigger. So if you have a product or service that you can tie into some bigger ideal, I think that's something that's going to be a very positive thing for your business. I'll give you another example. Um, French Toast Clothes, uh, one of our clients, again, it's in the fashion category, but it doesn't have to be. French Toast Clothes are clothes for little kids. And uh, I came up with a campaign that said, clothes should have labels, not people. That was one of the headlines. It just showed a bunch of kids, it's on my website, a bunch of kids standing, of course, in French toast clothes, but the headline was, you know, clothes should be labeled, not people. And it tied in with their clothes, it tied in with the fashion, but it had a bigger message that parents could, you know, understand. It's another visual had little kids doing a tug of war, and the headline was, it's the only war they should ever know. And again, it just took it to a whole other level. And I think, ultimately, it just made people like the brand French Toast more because it stood for some higher ideals than just selling clothes. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I didn't want to roll the conversation back too far, but did have a follow-up question on the, the metrics and, and how you tell. I mean, some of the things that we're using at the moment is... I guess new entrepreneurs in the game is surveys. You know, you have Survey Monkey, you pay nineteen ninety nine or something like that. And I see when I go online for e commerce, every time I check out, they're asking me a survey about how I found the products and things like right, that. Right, right. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, when when a group like Procter and Gamble brings in a focus group, you know, there are ways in which to tell how much to trust them versus the responses we're getting back can be anywhere from random to somebody trying to play the statistics or things like that. I mean, how? I don't know how much you've worked in this, but, but how much can you trust those surveys and how much can you? Most of the um, clients I've been involved with in the past 20 years have been smaller clients that don't have budgets to support doing extensive research. So a lot of it is very much gut. Um, in the case with Sorrel Ridge, for example, he spent $300,000 on this TV commercial supported by this print campaign and a month later sales were up 90%. 
So in that case, he didn't need to really do research to know that that was a great return on his investment. It was an amazing return on his investment. And for the year, it was up 52% nationally, while the, for the category of jams and confectionaries uh, was only up 3.5%. He was up 52 or 49 percent, something like that. It's actually a Forbes article, and that's on my website as well. So in that case, he just looked at sales. He looked at what he was spending, and he just counted the dollars that were coming in. And it was a pretty simple equation to know that that was extremely, extremely effective. It's not always the case. And how you measure that, again, is an area I don't have a lot of personal experience with. A lot of major brands have uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars doing the research because that's a, that's a very, very big issue. And this is the problem with a lot of traditional advertising, that some of it is, is really, it's debatable about how you can measure that. And on the internet, it's supposedly a little bit easier with, with the analytics, but not always the case. Uh, we hear a lot about like guerrilla marketing. I mean, can you talk a little bit, I mean, we've talked a lot about viral marketing online or you know print advertising TV advertising what do you think about uh, kind of marketing ideas and uh, that, that try to get more out there on the street and really be a little more interactive with consumers I think that's that's often a very cost effective way to do it one of the tactics we used was uh, one of our clients was a uh, a boat tour that there's in New York there's the circle line that sails all the way around Manhattan and uh, our client was a boat tour that just went around the, the bottom, the, the lower half of the, uh, the island. It was, we thought, the more interesting stuff. So instead of being on a boat for three hours, you were just on the boat to half the time and saw all the really good stuff. So one of the ideas we came up with was a barf bag. And on the barf bag it said, sailing three hours in a circle would make anyone seasick. So you, you get the double entendres there, circle for circle line and seasick with S-E-E sick. And so we created this thing and, and um, we started handing them out on, on the street to people who were about to get on the circle line. And so, you know, that, was, that came out of a very simple <laughs> creative idea, you know, with a shuttle that would take them, you know, across town to the seaport line, which is where our, our boats were. So, you know, if you could come up with something that's going to kind of cut through, I think that that's a great way to do it. You could, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of guerrilla marketing tactics, stencils on the streets, and that's where creativity really comes into play because you could often do things at a, at a relatively low cost if it's very high concept and um, can also be tied in with some kind of press. So a lot of startups will do things, you know, especially New York seems to be a, a place to do it, especially if it's on the street. If you do something on the street of New Haven, I'm not sure it's going to qu have quite the same effect. Yeah, I sort of comment on it, though. I think there are, New York City changed its litter laws. Uh, and New York City did? Yeah, because I think Microsoft launched this, they did something very creative, and then it got slapped by a huge fine because <laughs> they, like, graffitied or littered or something like that. Yeah. Well, you know, getting arrested could be good, too. <laughs> I mean, when, when I left New York, one of the things we did, um, this is kind of funny, this was like an unintended guerrilla marketing campaign. The, the church printed up a lot of my um, ads on subway posters, but they also printed tens of thousands of uh, postcards with my sayings on them. And um, I kept, I had like a few extra thousand in my apartment that I had to get rid of before I left the city and I didn't know what to do. I think I started putting them in some outdoor parks and things like that but I was getting ready to go and I was in a rush and I had all these things and I didn't want to just throw them down the trash chute so I went to the top of my 18-story building and threw them off the top <laughs> and I actually videotaped it and these things, this was on the corner of 23rd and Park at 5 o'clock as people were like coming home and the, the streets were just crowded. Can you imagine walking down the street and getting hit by a postcard telling you you should go to church? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe I created a whole new, you know, guerrilla marketing tactic, but, uh, and you know, they were like, all, I mean, they like littered the corner of 23rd and, and, and Park, but I was, you know, getting out of town the next morning, so I didn't, I didn't really care, but, um, you know, I mean, had I, 
had, you know, had the church been okay with that and known about that, that might have gotten rid- written up in the press because it's a very funny story, right? You know, so uh, sometimes, and that was, you know, it was totally unintended. I just, you know, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't bear throwing these things down the trash chute. And I figured, you know, the, the, the sanitation department would sweep them up the next day. But at least for several hours, people would be walking around. And even if they didn't get hit on the head with it, they were like all over the street. You know, whether they picked them up or not, they'd at least see them. So, you know, it's a pretty cost-effective way. I think the postcards were probably, uh, you know, 11 cents a piece or something like that when you print up that many. And uh, it's actually not a bad marketing strategy, you know, I think about it, you know. Um, so yeah, anytime you can do that, I think you know uh, it, it's great. Any questions? Well, if not, let's give uh, John a big round of applause.